sure by now uh, you're all aware of the different closings happening all over the state and all over the country as well. And uh, Bucknell University is not immune to that. So they will send the students home. The students should be gone from here by Tuesday. And um, then they'll do the rest of the semester remotely. You know, I, I, as I was talking with Father Wilkie about this, he said, now that you have nothing to do. <laughs> and so I applied at Walmart. I applied at Walmart. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's really a tragic event, not only for you know, people in the, in the normal scheme of things, but we have a number of seniors who are graduating this year, and you're supposed to have a certain amount of time to begin to grieve the loss of your friends, you know, and then move on to something new. And that, that time period was truncated. And any time we have that unexpected departure, it's really hard. So I ask you to pray not only for the students, but certainly for the professors too and the staff members, uh, many of whom might have uncertainty right now about how they're going to reach their students and about how we're going to keep things running. So uh, along the lines of that, there will be no longer any masses at Rook Chapel, uh, at least for the end of the semester, and just so you're aware of that. You know, whenever I, I hear this gospel, especially John's gospel, Jesus uses a lot of very mystical language and I feel so bad for these guys sometimes because, you know, Jesus will say something. Um, you know, Rabbi, he, he says, I have food you have no understanding of. And they're like, oh, did somebody bring him food? Did they? And Jesus is constantly saying, how much longer do I have to be with you people when you don't get this? And if I were there, I would be like, yeah, I don't get it. Do you guys get this? I don't understand. But to get a little insight in here, Jesus uses this word spirit and truth this term, spirit and truth, spirit and truth. And sometimes when we read something that's difficult or we don't get it, we just kind of skip over it. Because it's easier just to try to get something out of the rest of the gospel. And yet these two words are very important, not just for John's gospel, but for the whole message of Christ's mission. Spirit and truth. Well, what is truth? Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, we're going to hear this gospel in a few weeks on Good Friday and Palm Sunday. Quid es veritas? What is truth? Truth is what is. That's truth. I cannot breathe underwater without scuba gear or anything else. That's truth. That's, that's the way I was created. You know, um, my dog can smell a lot better than I can. It has more olfactory sensors, and a bear can smell better than she can. That's truth. That's not something that we can manipulate or change. That is truth. We cannot fly without the aid of a machine or something else. That's truth. So truth is what is. Spirit is what we believe or what we say we believe. And it's very important to distinguish here because people do not have to believe what we say, but they will believe what we do. The problem with the Israelites in the first reading is they are not worshiping in spirit and truth. They were clamoring to God, please free us from this slavery in Egypt. And they're free. And now they say, oh, I can't believe you forced us out of Egypt. We should go back. In other words, seemingly they wanted to be free, but once they were free, they didn't want the discomfort. They didn't want the uncertainty. They weren't living that freedom that they craved in truth. That's the difference. Even at this time, Jesus meets this woman at the well, and she is living in spirit, but not in truth. So just a long story short, a little background information. When the Israelites were taken into exile, they left behind all the poor. In other words, if you're going to take people captive and take them to your area, you want to take all the rabble-rousers. You want to take the, the educated people, the politicians, the priests, those who are higher, those who can cause a rebellion, you take all of them and you leave the people behind who don't know their left hand from their right hand. You, you keep the people behind who are not heroes and they're not going to start any rebellion. Those are the ones you just leave. And that's what happened. So all the, the up-and-comings are taken into exile. The poor and the, the simple, simple people are left behind. And so what are they going to do? Well, they begin to mix with the pagans around them. They have to do business. They have to, you know, live. 
So they made friends with the pagans. After a while, they began to intermarry with some of the pagans. Because who knows how long this exile is going to be. We don't have any priests or Pharisees. We don't have the law. We don't have a temple. It was sacked. So what are we going to do? So they begin also worshiping their other gods. And so you can imagine, once the exile is over and Cyrus the Persian says, go on back to Jerusalem, rebuild, and everything else, that all those who are in exile come back and they see those who are left behind mixing with the enemy. They actually called it adultery. Not idolatry, but adultery because they're being unfaithful to their God. And so they say to them, okay, you've been unfaithful to God and we were in exile. Now we exile you. You will go to Samaria. And those who resided in Samaria came to be known as the Samaritans. And that's why Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Because they were the lapsi. They were the ones who fell under pressure. So here is Jesus speaking with this woman. And she is worshiping in spirit, but not in truth. He says, you people worship what you don't understand. She's saying, we worship. And how do we know that she is not worshiping in truth? Because Jesus says, the guy you're with now is not your husband, neither were the last five. In other words, you say you're faithful to God, or you're trying to be faithful to God, but your truth says otherwise. In spirit, yes. Oh, yes, I believe in the commandments, I believe in the law of Moses, and I believe in God. In truth, I'm living as though I am God. I decide what I want to follow and not follow. And we can do the same thing. You know, you've heard people who might say, well, personally, I'm pro-life, but publicly, I support a woman's right to choose. Well, how does that work? I mean, one has to be a lie or the other. You can't do both. Or, or some politicians might run, you know, they say, personally, I'm opposed to it, but they might run a whole platform Supporting it. How does that work? I mean, there's got to be something wrong in that situation. <clears throat> Even among ourselves, we might say, I love everybody. As a Christian, I love everybody. And then we go home and we gossip about everybody. So there's a disconnect there. Or, I don't know if I believe in the real presence of the Eucharist privately, but publicly, I'm never going to miss communion. I'm always going to go to communion and I'm entitled to it and, and everything else. If you liken it to... You know, sometimes when I'm walking the dog around, and you're supposed to pick up after your dog. It's actually a law. And you've seen where some people have picked up after their dog, it's in a little baggie, and then they left the baggie right where it was. Well, what happened there? I mean, the law says, okay, so I fulfilled the law, and I bagged it up, but I just left it there. Or when I say, I am a Christian, and yet you can find me in Walmart fighting over a roll of toilet paper. You know, where did the Christianity go? So to live in spirit and in truth, to worship in spirit and in truth, means that we are not compartmentalizing our life. This is my real life and this is my spiritual life. We can't do that. Jesus accuses <clears throat> essentially the apostles of this. As he's getting ready to ascend, some of them worship, but they doubt it. And he said, don't be too hearted, diacardia. Don't be too hearted about this. Because they were. Part of them wanted to go back to fishing. Because it was comfortable, they understood it, they were good at it. But the other part required sacrifice. What is it that Jesus says about this? Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, because anything else is from the evil one. In other words, do not be a hypocrite. The hypocrite toy were the actors on stage who wore a mask while they were on stage, and then when they got down, they'd take away the mask and they were themselves. He said, be authentic. Be yourself, your Christian self that you're called to be. Even in the, the throes of this you know, pa <clears throat> pandemic, I mean, how many people have really legitimately, sincerely turned to prayer? Or am I just watching the television and doing what I'm told and washing hands and everything else? I mean, do we believe this or not? Do we believe that God has power beyond what we say or not. So Lent is a time when we're supposed to examine our lives and find out where we need to grow. To take those things we've obtained that really aren't good for us and get rid of them, and that to obtain those things that we really need to make us better. This is a time to look at our life and ask the question, am I just worshiping in spirit? 
Do I say I believe these things, but I'm not really living it? What is my truth that I'm living? Regardless of whether people see it or not, what is my truth? Because anything else, if it is not in spirit and truth, is only from the evil one. Let us stand now and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages.